While 2020 might be objectively one of the worst years in human history, that doesn't mean everything has been all bad. Video games have been more important now than they've ever been, and 2020 had some killer games released. With the Game Awards coming up in a few days, I decided to throw together a little video of my top 5 games of 2020. A few things first, this is my personal, subjective, opinionated list. Your games of the year might differ, and that's totally okay. These are just the games that I personally enjoyed the most this year. And number two, I haven't played every single game to release this year, so there might be some big ones missing that I definitely want to get to eventually, but but whether that be time or money, I just haven't played yet. Okay? Alright, cool. Let's get started. Gears Tactics was a game I was going to get regardless of my experience with the turn-based strategy genre, simply because it had a Crimson Omen slapped on the cover. Not knowing what to expect from Tactics, I popped the game into my Xbox One S and all of a sudden six hours had passed. Needless to say, I greatly enjoyed my time with Gears Tactics. I would admit that some of that enjoyment stems from the fact that it does take place in the Gears universe I adore so much. It translates near perfectly from Gears' usual third-person cover-based shooting to traditional turn-based strategy games with some bells and whistles that tie everything together nicely. You can chainsaw your foes in two, close emergence holds with grenades, perform executions, all while having to make strategic decisions on where units should move to, which abilities they should use, or which enemy they should target. The variety of enemies you face spices up encounters, just like the franchise always has, taking on wretches, boomers, Theron guards, Cantuses, and even Brumox as bosses. But the most surprisingly enjoyable aspect has to be the customization options. Each mission has rewards for completing them, and on the battlefield there's always supply cases of varying rarities containing armor, helmets, attachments, and upgrades that can be applied to your squad. This is extremely addicting, so much so I often put my squad in harm's way to grab a case or two. Once you start recruiting soldiers into your army, you can go wild, and it's really fun to create badass looking gears and give them unique names and backstories in your head, and then cry when they inevitably bite the dust. The customization is so great, I hope it becomes a staple of the franchise going forward. Being able to add cool cosmetic attachments to your weapons or create your own gear in Gear 6 would be an awesome selling point. While I've dabbled in turn-based strategy games in the past, most notably games like the XCOM reboots and Fire Emblem, I wouldn't consider myself a fan of the genre. Gears Tactics rides a pretty pretty fine line in terms of where it stands as an entry point, being beginner friendly enough for those who aren't familiar with the genre to settle in quite nicely, but challenging enough to give longtime veterans a great tactical experience, and has made me reconsider where I stand on the genre as a whole. Overall, a stellar foundation that will hopefully be a springboard for more Gears Tactics games in the future. Animal Crossing has quietly been one of my favorite Nintendo franchises, starting all the way back on the GameCube and all the way through Happy Home Designer on the 3DS. While the wait between New Leaf and New Horizons was painful, especially when Nintendo announced Amiibo Festival to a starved Wii U audience, I'm glad to say the wait was absolutely worth it. New Horizons takes the Animal Crossing franchise in a new and exciting direction while retaining what makes the series so relaxing and enjoyable. The emphasis on crafting, while a tired trend in the industry at this point, does lend itself well to the tropical setting New Horizons goes for, terraforming and being able to really craft your dream island with paths, outside decorations, and customizable items provides near endless possibilities. The base gameplay of Animal Crossing is still intact, gathering resources like fruit or fish, selling them at the shop to buy clothing or furniture or pay off your house, all while chatting with your villagers, donating fossils to the museum, or planting flowers around your island to make it pop. That base is built upon so well that it'd be very difficult for Nintendo to follow up New Horizons without it. While New Leaf was the best the series had to offer up to that point, Nintendo was able to improve on almost everything, finally bringing us an HD HD Animal Crossing experience that feels like a full realization of the series as a whole. It's kind of difficult to describe why I really enjoy Animal Crossing so much. There's nothing exciting or flashy about it. It's a life sim, and a damn good one at that. There's nothing quite like kicking back after a long day at work and settling into your routine on your island, making small incremental steps of progress each day until your bridge is built, or your mortgage is paid off, or a new store opens. With the way the world is currently, a slice of normalcy is comforting, and that's what Animal Crossing New Horizons delivers. Comfort. Being able to tune the world out and focus on your island, building whatever island you want, be it contemporary or out of this world, is almost therapeutic in a way. It's the game we needed in 2020 and Nintendo delivered. Final Fantasy VII is an absolute classic, beloved by millions and widely regarded as one of the best games ever created. Square Enix decided to take on the monumental challenge of remaking it from the ground up for current gen consoles with an ambitious multi-part saga of sorts. Part 1 dropped in early 2020 and was pretty damn great in my opinion. Although it has its faults, namely some pacing and level design issues, I had a wonderful time reliving the entire Midgar portion of the original Final Fantasy VII. Cloud, Barret, Tifa, and Aerith were classic Final Fantasy characters to begin with, but the remake does wonders with them, with the 
obvious improved visuals as well as much better dialogue and voice acting that makes you connect with them much more than the original. While Cloud is always this badass with a sword the size of an aircraft carrier, he was never really characterized all too well, but now you really get to see how his abrasive exterior is hiding his softer side. And man, Square Enix really laid it on with Aerith. She's so adorable and kind-hearted. They really play that up and it makes me so sad knowing that she eventually- <laughs> While the story of Avalanche taking on the Shinra Corporation was stretched from a few hour intro to an entire 40 hour game, the characters carry most of the weight through some of the more awkward pacing issues. That's not to say all the extra fluff Square Enix added was bad. I really enjoyed the expanded roles of Biggs and Wedge, who get entire story arcs this time around and really fill part of the cast. And seeing the updated version of the cross-dressing cloud scene was just absolute magic. While the story and characters have been relatively unchanged, the game's combat has been reworked dramatically and it's the best part of the game in my opinion. It's this unique mix of real-time and turn-based gameplay that allows players to engage its hack and slash combat and pause the action to heal, buff, or use abilities, or unleash limit breaks. The combat really shines in the boss battles where you have to be constantly keeping track of attack patterns, switching between party members on the fly, balancing attacking and defending, knowing when to use effective limit breaks, so on and so forth. It can be a real blast. Going hand in hand with the combat is the classic materia system, which is always fun. Switching out materia on your weapons or armor to gain better abilities and building certain characters into particular roles in your party. You can upgrade weapons and all sorts of stats, including additional materia slots, so you can really build your character to your liking. The way the materia system works in sync with the combat is one of the best parts of the original game, and it's translated pretty well into the remake. Overall, while it's the most flawed game on this list for me anyway, that doesn't diminish its beauty, its combat, its characters, or my overall enjoyment of Final Fantasy VII's remake. It's a fantastic starting point for Part 2, and it's made me even more excited to get my hands on Final Fantasy XVI. During quarantine, I played a lot of video games, one of which was Ori and the Blind Forest, a 2D metroidvania I heard great things about but never really got around to playing, and when I did, I was absolutely blown away. It was an incredible experience I'll touch upon in more detail in the future, but needless to say, upon finishing the Blind Forest, I immediately picked up its sequel, The Will of the Wisps. The Blind Forest set the bar pretty high for me, and The Will of the Wisps soared well over it. Ori has to be one of the most technically beautiful games I have ever seen in my entire life, and running at 60 frames per second, it, well after the day one patch that is, it feels like you're playing a high quality animated film at times. The gameplay is much improved and streamlined from the Blind Forest's already great foundation. Exploring the world is always fun as the movement and expanded abilities you collect throughout the game open the world up the farther you progress in the game. Being a metroidvania of sorts, Ori never succumbs to the pitfalls the genre can be known for. I was never lost throughout my playthrough always knowing exactly where I needed to go or where I could explore, and the level design is amazing enough that backtracking was never an issue. The Will of the Wisp relies on epiphanies, that aha moment when you realize that new ability you unlocked or that key you found will allow you to gain access to a location previously inaccessible. The pace of Ori as a whole is so well executed these epiphanies happen at regular intervals, always making you feel like you're making meaningful progress every step you take. The combat is great, with loads of different options from traditional hack and slash to AoE to ranged, and is more involved than the Blind Forest. It's a much more grandiose adventure with side quests and shops and a multitude of characters to chat up. The story and tone are the true stars of the show in my opinion. Moon Studios' storytelling is emotional, always pulling at your heartstrings and really getting you invested in the world of the Will of the Wisps. This goes without saying, but the music is also stupendous, and I recommend giving the soundtrack a listen. It ties the visuals and gameplay together so well, it's just amazing. With gorgeous visuals, fantastic gameplay, and most importantly, heart, Moon Studios have produced a truly beautiful game, and I'm glad I was able to experience it. Doom Eternal is one of the best games I have ever played in my entire life. It's a fast-paced, frenetic, action-packed adrenaline rush from start to finish, and it plays like a dream. It towers over Doom 2016 in its own separate category of perfection. There is so much going on you have to take stock of at any given time that Doom Eternal feels almost like a first-person shooter RTS at times. Any combination of enemies can fill arenas from the smallest imp to the towering cyber demon that all have their own unique attack patterns, AI behaviors, and weaknesses you have to take into account if you want to survive. The gameplay-driven ammo and health system from the previous game has been added to with a new armor drop. Using the new flame belch to set demons ablaze provides you with armor similar to how chainsawing enemies gives you ammo and glory kills rewards you with health. This triangular armor health ammo system is constantly switched between as you're pumping demons full of lead, glory killing them for health, turning around to light another on fire to collect more armor, and chainsawing another to regain the ammo you just spent. Utilizing Eternal's new toys like the previously mentioned flame belch, the super shotgun meat hook, and the ability to air dash in any direction adds tremendously to the flow of combat. The combinations are able to 
pull off in Doom Eternal, all player driven by the way, is incredible. There was a point in time in a particular Slayer Gate on Ultra Nightmare that I entered some otherworldly zen-like state of flow that the likes of which I have never experienced in a game before. That's not even to mention the music. Mick Gordon tops his work of 2016, delivering a pulse-pounding, head-banging killer of a soundtrack so good, BFG 10,000 is permanently stuck in my head. It's a truly monumental achievement in both game design and entertainment value, and it's one of the most fun and rewarding games I have ever had the privilege of playing. Id Software has not only made the game of the year for 2020, but has started off this new, terrible decade with what might just be the first-person shooter to end all first-person shooters. Oh, <laughs>